Well, it's my time to introduce again the lion. <laughs> that, that gets old now, so I have to think of something else out of it. <laughs> but you remember the lion and uh, that he is, um, he's, he's not safe, but he's good. <laughs> and you know why he's good? Because he is a craftsman of the Word of God. Amen. Really enjoyed uh, listening to you, Aldo, and the craftsmanship that you bring to the Word of God. And the grace, the man, the Bible says it's a manifold grace of Christ. And you do bring the, all the reliefs of that grace of Christ um, to the surface and to the minds and hearts of the people. So, craftsmen, come over. <laughs> I, have, I feel like the Lord have, had to make me really focus on grace uh, so people would tolerate me as a pastor. Some people can get away with it because they have nicer personalities or whatnot. I can't. So my only hope to be a pastor is to be obsessed with what I'm supposed to be obsessed about. So I guess it's good. Um, thanks, David. So I want to get right into it. Um, for time's sake, I have the probably most controversial topic in Miami. But, hey, I'm controversial, so that's all good. I'm not going to talk about, and I want to say very clearly, I'm talking about aberrant and dangerous elements of charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity. I'm not saying it entirely, okay? Um, but I don't want to talk about the very explicit, clear issues in the movement, like clear, very clear issues like Jesus died to give you a Benz. I'm not going to talk about that. That's just too obvious, what I want to talk about is the subtle issues in the movement that are safer to thrive because they're not so obvious. Um, I think a lot of times we have these conversations and we say, well, we all believe the gospel. Isn't that fine? And I'm like, well, a CEO of a company can have certain values uh, that are good, but the company can be run with principles inconsistent with those values. So simply because someone has a proper view of the gospel, but they run the company of the church with values and principles totally inconsistent with that, it doesn't matter what your values are. How you run the organization and the principles consistent with that will be the most important thing about your values that you hold internally. So I, I want to talk about how things in this movement are very inconsistent with gospel uh, consistency. And in many ways, it's, we subtly lose the gospel. And I also want to say, this is a shepherding issue. This is not us planting the flag of reform and saying we're on this side and that side. This is about loving people in Miami, helping people in Miami see more of Christ. And if I sound like some intense dude that's just how I am I'm not like angry with the weird Pentecostal elements of Miami I just preached like that um, but I'm saying in the beginning of the message we, we, we need to love people in this city who are struggling with these things so first issue that I see is a misuse of the cross of Christ and it kind of looks like this. Uh, I was in the car driving and I saw someone going through the stoplight and they went like this. Uh, in, the, in the aberrant Pentecostal movement, it doesn't look like this. It just looks like stating in the name of the blood of Jesus. I cover my kids in the blood and uh, I, it's almost like in a, before an emergency or after emergency, I state the blood of Jesus as if it has some sort of incantational power. And what is wrong with that? Do I just not like that? No, let me tell you what is wrong with that. The issue is, it is more about having faith in the cross's use than the cross itself. It's more about having faith in the cross's use than the cross itself, which is just faith in ourselves. Let me go to, uh, let me use an illustration that's helpful. Uh, my kids don't use the sofa rocking chair to sit and rest. They think the sofa rocking chair is to do flips. 
and perform. So in this movement, the blood of Jesus is not a seat to rest your life in. It is a launch pad for your performance. So what, what do we do about this? How do we help with this? Well, I think we need to have a proper definition of what faith is. A proper definition of faith. Let me read Galatians 2.19. For through the law I have died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I now no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. What is faith? In the Son of God. So faith has the object of a person and a particular nature and identity. Faith is in a someone. What about this someone? Faith in the Son of God who loved me. Someone who has this kind of one-way affection and gave himself for me. So, so faith looks to a someone who did a something in my place for my badness. This is what faith looks to. So to believe in Jesus is not to use the cross magically, but it is to look to the Christ of the cross in faith in his redemptive cross work for your sins. Jesus' cross is not a bat to swing around and perform for Jesus. Jesus' cross is an object to look to as a sinner who needs grace. Which is why Paul says in Colossians 2, 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ the Lord. So in the same way that you received Christ, the conquering, substituted Lord, so walk in him. So how do I trust Jesus as a Christian in my ongoing life? It is in the same way it started. Not in some different mystical way where Jesus becomes an incantational tool for you to be performing for Jesus. That's the first thing I see is we, we misuse the cross of Christ and we lose the cross of Christ. The second thing I see is a problem of the exaltation of the devil. The Christian life looks more like Harry Potter than the New Testament. What is wrong with this? Are you just one of these guys who just loves to pick on people? Let me tell you what's wrong, beloved. We diminish the preeminence of Christ by emphasizing someone else more than the preeminent Christ. It's not just that we deny Christ. I don't, have, I don't deny my wife by saying you're not my wife. I deny my wife by being preoccupied with another woman more than her, even though I don't deny her verbally. Make sense? Here's, here's, you know, Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He talked about sexual issues. He talked about spiritual gifts. He talked about, you know, revol reversing roles. But he said, my main topic and subject was Jesus Christ himself and his work. It was never anyone else, including the devil. So here's the problem. In the movement, we focus more on what the devil does or doesn't do than Christ. We focus more on what we do or don't do with the devil than Christ. And so we subtly lose Christ, not by denying Christ, but by misdirecting our attention on somebody else, namely the devil and his minions. So what do we do about this? What do we do about this? The remedy, my, my brothers and sisters, is a crucicentric, cross-centered, I like that word, a crucicentric, cross-centered, already victory perspective of the demonic realm. A cross-centered, already victory perspective of the demonic realm. Let me read Colossians 2.13. And when you were dead in your trespass in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all of our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. And he is taken out of the way by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them by him. So when was the devil defeated decisively by God? It was not when you, in the name of Jesus, with your incantations and your name and claim it, battled him like Star Wars now. The devil was defeated once and for all, decisively, definitively, eternally, comprehensively, when Jesus Christ was crucified in our law place for our law breaking, period, point blank. 
Revelation 20 exists now. He has been bound by virtue of Christ being bound for our law breaking. So he has been punished, defeated, period, point blank. We fight him now by how? We fight him by appropriating and holding to his cross-centered victory for us. We don't need to focus on him. You know, it's almost like in D-Day, or not D-Day, in Hiroshima, we... We went down and we just dropped a bomb and that was it. And what we did later was just cleaning up. Church, the atom bomb of the cross of Christ has already defeated the devil comprehensively. And we are the cleanup crew existing in that victory. The exaltation of the cross of Christ, exaltation of the cross over the fighting of the demons is a way to remedy that. Second, third issue is a redirection of sinfulness. Man, this thing is it's hard to get used to, right? Especially for someone like me who moves all around. I'm in, a, I'm in a casket now. I can't move. All right. You need to like be handcuffed here. So here's what it looks like, the redirection of sinfulness. It is that every single sin issue is because of a spirit. So I have a depression spirit, therefore I am depressed. I have a drunken spirit, therefore I am drunkard. I have a sexual temptation spirit. You know what I'm talking about? Everything sinful is caused by an external spiritual being who creates this sin problem. Now, what is the problem with this? What's wrong with this? Again, are you just one of these Bible bullies? Yes, I am, but that's not the point. We diminish human sin, which leads to diminishing the gospel. We diminish human sin and culpability, and in doing so, we diminish the gospel. Look at what Jesus says in Mark. Are you lacking understanding? Don't you realize that nothing going in from outside of the man can defile him? That includes spirits. For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. Then he said, what comes out of a person, that defiles him. You defile you. Ain't no spirit's fault. He just plays upon your defilement as it comes out of you. For from within out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual morality, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, promiscuity, stinginess, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. So here's the problem. You know why the Pharisees couldn't understand Jesus rightly? Because they couldn't understand their sin rightly. Because they were always attributing sinfulness to be something about something out there. So if we we don't define sin rightly, we don't get the gospel rightly, and we lose both those things appropriately. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, here's the first remedy. We need a biblical definition of sin. And a corresponding ministry in light of sin's definition. A biblical definition of sin and a corresponding ministry in light of sin's definition. Let me read Hebrews 3.12. Watch out, brothers, so there won't be in any one of you a evil, unbelieving heart. Oh, this is a problem. That departs from living God. Not watch out for you for the unbelieving spirit. Watch out for you in your Jesus not trusting heart that is so prone to not trust Jesus. Therefore, walk away from Jesus. Therefore, live ungodly. This is the problem. And so we need to get to the root of the problem. Here's here's an illustration which I think is helpful. My kids like to walk away from me a lot. Right? And... Imagine they walk away from me because they don't trust me. They trust themselves. And then someone, some, some teenager finds them and lures them away to do all sorts of like bad stuff like stealing and spray painting and they get, you know, drinking, right? Getting drunk and whatever. What was the problem? Was a person coming to snatch them the problem? Was what they did with that person the problem? No. The problem is they left my side. And because they left my side, they got into all that stuff. You see where I'm going? Because we leave the side of our sufficient Lord and walk away, 
the demons have their way. So we got to get to leaving the side of our master and self-confidence, which is what the devils use, and stop getting stuck with the spirits. Make sense? So we need to redirect. The problem is the redirection of sinfulness that we need to redefine appropriately. Beloved, the Gospel of John says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. Not if we identify the sin spirits and engage them appropriately. My hope is that I would see that deep down in my heart, I am a transgressor of God's law who is unbelieving, who needs to acknowledge before God's one-way, unconditional grace in Christ that I need to be cleansed by my Savior. Not find el mágico Christian shaman to appropriately engage the particular external to me spirit. So the redirection of sinfulness is a problem in this movement. Fourthly, and this is, you know, I think what I'm saying here is probably going to get outside and go to other movements as well, but it's more prominent here. It's the misinterpretation of miracles. The misinterpretation of miracles. So this is what I hear people say. Hey, I, I believe the whole Bible. Me too. And since I see miracles in the Bible, this is what I focus on. This is what I'm about. So what, what is the problem with being preoccupied with raising the dead, healings, and all these things as a essential Christian emphasis and direction of the Christian life? What's wrong with, you know, I had an unbeliever come to my church, and she, she said, I went to this church in Miami, and they had all these people with wheelchairs in the front, and they all, like, you know, were falling around, and she was like, that was weird. And I was like, yeah. But why would we say that? Why would we say that apart from us just being anti-supernatural, reformed, heady people who don't believe God's miraculous anymore, right? We put God in a box. Why, why, why would we address that this focus and preoccupation is dangerous and unhealthy? Let me, let me explain. The issue is the Christ's cross-centered point of the miracle is lost in the miracle. You hear what I'm saying, beloved? The Christ cross-centered point of the miracle is lost in the miracle. Let me read a text for you that may help. Mark 2.8 says, Right away, Jesus understood in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat and walk? Listen. But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, get up and walk. So what is the point of this paralyzed guy getting up? I am showing you my power over the effects of the fall so you know the root and cause of the fall is what I came to redeem you from. So the point of me showing exercising power over the effects of the fall, namely paralysis, is that you would know that I am the one who has conquered and defeated the, the source of the fall by substituting myself for the source of the fall in your union with Adam and his sin in, and guilt. This is the point of the miracle. Is that fair to say that's in the text? First John 6, same thing. Hey, Jesus, you're about making bread. Come on. Let's make a bread kingdom. That's not the point. Jesus says that's not the point. The miracle leads to something. So listen, when, when we go to Orlando, we need signs on the way to Orlando, right? But when you get to Orlando, do you keep putting up signs in Orlando? No. You're there. You see where I'm going? The signs have led us to the fact that Jesus is our propitiation, our justification, our adoption, our ransom, our rescue, everything. These are the signs, the miracles are the signs leading to that. And once we have arrived there, we have arrived. No need to perpetually put more signs because the signs have taken us to the reality, which is our redemption in Christ. Beloved, miracles must bring us to the essence of what is truly miraculous. Miracles must bring us to the essence of what is truly miraculous, and that is the saving, reconciling, redeeming blood of Christ. So what does this look like? 
Jesus' bread is about him being my substitute who's, who's, who's crucified for my sins. And because I feed on him in the way the miracle points to feeding on them physically, I am redeemed by trusting in my Savior who's crucified for me. That's the point. Jesus raising a paralytic is, is pointing me to the fact that because Jesus did what he did and that word proclaimed that what we did comes to me by the power of the Holy Spirit, I now have the power to be raised to walk a Christian life of faith. This is the point of the paralytic miracle. Jesus walking on water is not so you can walk on water. It's that Jesus is the one who takes us safely through the waters of judgment. He takes us safely through the exodus by virtue of bringing us into his death and resurrection. And because I'm united in him, I go safely and pass through the waters of judgment through Christ, my law keeper being judged for me. That's the point of the walking water miracle. Jesus turning water to wine is not so we can create things out of nothing. But the fact that only God's new covenant blessings by virtue of our covenant keeper will bring us salvation, eternal life, and hope. And none of the water purification rituals of man will do that. This is the point. Blindness is about the fact that in Christ, in union with him, we can now see God. We can see God. I can see him by faith. Not that we now can go and have this power to deal with sight. By all means, pray for people to be healed all day long. Pray in your church about it. Do it. Oh, God, you know, I don't know. No, no, pray. We should pray like Pentecostals for healing. But we know the healings in the Bible are about what? The centrality of the work of Christ, not the centrality of the continuation of miracles. I'm not doing Jedi mind tricks with the text. I'm just trying to be as simple as possible. Leprosy, all these things. So moving on, at that point I had to stay a little bit longer. Here's another issue in the movement. Multiple baptisms or revivalism. You know what I'm talking about. It's the first baptism, the second baptism, the third baptism of the Spirit. Or it's the revival every single Sunday. Every single Sunday, we have a revival and a rededication and a reappropriation and a rebaptism. This is, the second baptism is a little bit more like definitive, like one moment, another moment. The revivalism is just all the time. There's always this necessary revival. They say, what's wrong with you? Don't you know revival's in the Bible? Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me try to put this in perspective. What, what is wrong with this? What is dangerous about this? Here's the issue, beloved. Practice leads to our position. Not our position to our practice. This is the issue with the multiple baptism and revivals. Our practice leads to our position in Christ rather than our position leading to our practice. And so the gospel framework is lost. So the, you know what I was saying? The company has these ways of being run. It's inconsistent with the values of the company. We now have a view of spirituality and growth which denies the very essence of our community. We get positions and blessings based upon the continuing practice of ourselves. So how, how, do, we, how do we deal with this issue? How do we deal with this issue? Beloved, we deal with this issue by living regularly from our justification. We live regularly from our just, we live regularly from our position. You know, Ephesians 1, we have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. <laughs> that means that the most meager Christian at the moment of faith has every single thing that he needs to be a Christian at that moment. Not because he has a moral moment. Not because he has another baptism. Not because he has another decision. At the moment someone places their faith in the crucified and resurrected Lord, every single blessing and privilege is his. This, beloved, this changes everything in the church. Always, this is, I, I love Paul. He just speaks for me. So if you have been raised with the Messiah... 
Seek what is above where the Messiah is seated. You know that seatedness, that exaltedness, that triumphantness, that the, that the last Adam obeying perfectly and dying crucicentrically and being raised and he's now up there in heaven glorified. You know that, that man? He says, think about that man up there. That's where you are. Look, listen, listen. Set your minds on what is above, not what is on the earth, for you have died. And your life is hidden with the Messiah in God. Not seek the second blessing on earth based upon the moral hierarchy on earth. But seek the already blessing in heaven because of the unitedness that you have with the Christ in heaven. Because of the work that he did on earth 2,000 years ago. You know, here's a picture that I like. There's two pictures in the church. The first is dating a woman you're not married to. You know what dating's like? Each date, you get a little further with the girl, right? I'm not talking about sexually, just relationally. You, you get a little further with her. Higher up, she likes you more, right? This is how we talk about the Christian in the church. You, you know, you have dates with Jesus, and you have commitments to Jesus, and you have things for Jesus, and you kind of move up the relational ladder. But let me give you a better picture. It's the picture of me dating my daughter. She's not getting higher levels of relationship with me through life. The moment I held her in my arms, she had everything what it means to be connected to me. And our dating is us going deeper into everything that she had before she did anything as a little crying baby. That's the Christian life. Not levels of commitment and revival and baptisms to increase the moral ladder of relationship and position. No, we're going deeper into everything we already have by virtue of Christ. This is the problem. This is what it's about. So, okay, here, here we go. I may get less amens as it goes on. And you know what, maybe I'm wrong about some of these things. And you know, hope, you know maybe, maybe someday you can help me with that. But for now, I feel like this is appropriate to say. Gospel-less spirituality. Gospel-less spirituality. What I mean is spiritual qualities which are emphasized which don't demand conversion. Spiritual qualities that are emphasized that do not demand conversion. Like prophesying. Like hearing prophecy, like tongues, like miracles and dreams. This become things that are emphasized to mark your legit spirituality. We're in Miami. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, what's wrong with that? Here you go again, Aldo. It's all you do. Let me tell you what's wrong with this, beloved. Let me tell you. It promotes... An unregenerate spirituality as the essence of spirituality. You don't need to be a Christian to do any of those things. You know that? Let me read a text. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and we prophesy in your name. They ain't lying to Jesus in, the, in glory, okay? This is an eschatological conversation, end time conversation. There's no... Oh, uh, no, eh, no, you weren't, you weren't prophesying. No, they were saying we were prophesying to the Lord before him. Cast out demons in your name and do many, many miracles in your names, and I will announce to them, I never knew you. Saul prophesied, lost dude. Balaam prophesied, lost guy. Judas did everything everybody else did, but he was a son of Satan. So you see the problem with emphasizing things in the church as being marks of spirituality which don't even demand being a Christian. And this is what we look up to our ministers for because they have these abilities and you don't even need to be a Christian for it. Do you see the problem? What is the remedy to this? You need to emphasize the spirituality that demands the gospel. By the power of the Spirit. Let me read a text for you that does that. 
1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Is not boastful. Is not conceited. Doesn't act improperly. Is not selfish. Is not provoked. Does not keep a record of wrongs. Finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Who can do that? No one. Only the Lord of glory who entered into our law place did that perfectly. So when I see that as what I'm called to do as a Christian, it drives me away from myself and points to me Christ, my lover, my substitute. And as I look to him because I can't do that, I begin to live like him and reflect that. Because I can't do that by myself. I can prophesy all day long, but I can't not keep a record of wrongs. I love keeping a record of wrongs. So if we emphasize these things which are more the marks of what it means to be a Christian, it will drive us away from ourselves to the supremacy of Christ, which will in turn produce a real spirituality that is God-necessary and God-centered. Because those things are not the essence. Here's another issue, and this is where I may lose some of you. Gospel-less edification. Gospel-less edification. This means that we can be built up by things not explicitly related to the person and work of Jesus Christ. What does this look like? Generic prophecy. Hey, you're going to have a good week. Hey, this is going to be your year. Hey, you're going to be powerful and mighty person, successful person. You're going to be successful. The Lord's going to use you. Generic encouragement. Or, here's another one, and look, I love you. Going by myself and speaking in non-coherent languages that I don't know anything about. Speaking things that I have no clue about or no one else has no clue about. Prophecies about things that are not about Jesus' work. Spiritual experiences that are not about Jesus' work. So what's, what's the problem? What's the problem with these things? Why? Why? What's your problem? Don't a lot of godly people do this stuff? Yeah. Probably more godly than me. But what is, what, is, what is the issue with this? Let me tell you what I think the issue is. If people, people can edify themselves in a non-Christ cross-specific way, which means the gospel is not needed for edification. If you can edify yourself in a non-Christ cross-specific way, then the gospel is not needed for your edification. It's almost like this. There's only one appropriate way for my wife to receive romantic attention. It's from me. Not anybody else. There's only one way that she can receive appropriate attention and encouragement of, in a romantic way. It's from me. Nobody else. There's no other door. There's no other option. So what does that look like here? Let me, let me read a text that may help. Colossians 2 says, be careful that no one keeps you, takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on elemental forces, and not based on Christ. So he's saying, be careful about things that build you up that are not based on Christ. That doesn't mean be careful about things that are satanic, explicitly satanic. It says, be careful of things that are not based on Christ. So how do we, what is it to be based upon, to be built up based on Christ? Paul, can you tell us? For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And you have been filled by him who is the head over every rule and authority. You were circumcised in him with the circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of the Messiah. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. To be based on Christ, to be built up, is to be about these things. Christ is everything. Christ is your your baptism, he is your substitute, he's your forgiveness, he's your resurrection. This is what it means to be built up based on Christ. And anything that's not that is not good. Let me give an illustration that may help. Two couples are high on ecstasy together. Is that a real connection? No, they're just high around each other. They're not high on each other. You see where I'm going? Jesus can make us high all the time on all sorts of things that feel great, but we're not high on Jesus. 
Because what makes me high on Jesus is knowing about what he, what he has done for me and how he loves me. So if I'm not high on Jesus, I'm just high around Jesus even though he's around. Listen, I think that Christ's person and work is a non-negotiable necessity for every aspect of the Christian life. There's no point in your life, there's no detail which does not demand Jesus' person and work told to you and believed to be what builds you up. People tell me, hey, you're a great young man. The Lord told me, that's not going to do nothing for me. People telling me to get the power to speak things that I don't know is not going to do Tell me about Jesus. Please. Which is why Paul says in Acts 20, 32, now I commit you to God and to the message, ooh, the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. What is able to build you up? The message of his grace. The message of his grace. Beloved, we need to be built up in the church by things that are always specifically about Jesus and his work. There is no exceptions. And I think so many people who love Jesus are wasting so much time wasting so much time having these shallow encouraging moments they're not really going to help them I've dealt with that in Miami a lot we are a reformed church that doesn't attract reformed people and I feel like a lot of people are distracted with these things so moving on I don't want to get stuck anywhere man all right I gotta move 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 Here's another issue I see in the movement. A false dichotomy of word and spirit. A false separation of word and spirit. People in this movement want to say, hey, man, you know what you guys do? I'm going to be sarcastic. Can I do some satire? You guys have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. That sounds, I've been in rooms. Yeah. What are you saying? I don't, what does that mean? What is this? What is this separation of the Spirit from the work of Christ? What is this? This is curious to me. How do we do that? Listen, listen, listen. 1 John 5, 6. Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood. This is the ministry of Jesus, his baptism and his crucifixion. Not by water only, but water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies. So what is the Spirit doing? He's testifying. He is witnessing to the ministry of Jesus. For they, there are three who testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater. Beloved, if I were to take a lighter in front of you right now and start sparking it, what would that do? It would just spark. I gotta have some gas, pre existing gas, some substance to spark that. So it's almost like you got. What is this spark talk? This is always going together. Beloved, Christ's cross word work is always attached to the Spirit, they're never separated. They're never, they're, it's, that never happens. When the spirit of truth comes, John 16, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He got no own little ministry about all these other things that are not about Jesus and his cross. Nothing. He will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine. He's taken all that historic, redemptive, saving work. He's going to take all that stuff and he will... Declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. But Galatians 3, 5. So does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles? By works among, by, by, among you by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? What's the Spirit? How is the Spirit working miracles? As you hear the word 
of the gospel. Beloved, the Bible never says that the Holy Spirit is essentially the power of God. What does the Bible say the power of God is? The gospel is the power of God. And the Holy Spirit unleashes the power of the gospel word. The gospel is not a power of God. It's not some power of God. It is the power of God. It is the definition of power. The essence of power. The gospel is the power of God in this universe. Do not talk to me about being too much about the gospel because we're not about power and Holy Spirit. To be about the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is to be about the gospel. We don't have a bipolar triune God. Holy Spirit is not doing his own thing over here while Christ the Son is working over here. We have Father who has architected all, the Son who has accomplished all in himself, and the Spirit who unleashes all the Father accomplished in the Son. We cannot separate these things. They always are married together. So I, I think that's a huge problem. We have this ministry of the Holy Spirit that is independent of the gospel's work and word. Holy Spirit's like, I, I don't got nothing to do with that. I'm all, about, I'm all about the sun. Moving on. All right, 40 minutes. 40 minutes. I think another problem is experientialism. Experientialism. It looks like this. It happened to me, so it's true. <laughs> We're laughing because isn't, isn't this what we deal with so much in Miami? It happened to me. So, this, this is what, you know what the illustration of this is? Uh, someone was really making me mad. I punched them and they don't bother me no more. It happened to me. So what? It happened. It's true. Does it mean that that's an actual solution? Or, man, I was really depressed, I got high, and I'm, I had a better day. It happened to me. Great. Is that a biblical experience? Because it happened to you and it worked. No. No, let me read a text for you, 1 Corinthians 12. Now, concerning what comes from the Spirit, brothers, I don't want you to be unaware. You were pagans. I'm so glad Jose's preaching Corinthians in Miami. This is our letter. It's our letter. Let's own it. You were let off to the idols that could not speak. Therefore, I'm informing you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So they were doing all this great, exciting stuff in Corinth. And Paul says what? The test of your experience is not your experience, but how your experience is consistent with the objective, crucified, declared Lord of glory. If it's consistent with what has been said to be true about the centrality of Christ, then it's a spiritual experience. But beloved, what we do so much is we redefine the word of the gospel based upon our experience, and we subtly redefine the word of the gospel. Because it happened to me, beloved. But God's declarations about us in Christ always have to ground our experience. Always. Which is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, what? Y'all better be prophesying up in there. What is prophecy? Prophecy is a proclamation and declaration of the prophetic Lord who has lived for us, died for us, loves us, and keeps us. And, is, and that's, that's what prophet. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19. And you know, here, here's, here's a, a real small explanation of how this becomes problematic. If your experience is what defines the word of God... Let me, let, let me get into your world, Christian. How often, do, do, you, do you feel saved all the time? Do you not feel saved often? How, how, would, how would your Christian life look like if you only felt saved how often you felt saved? You can't live your life like that, right? You need an objective outside of you word about an objective outside of you Christ who is enough to live your Christian life under that word. Experience cannot define God's word, but God's word and gospel word needs to define our experience. So I have one more. I have two more points, but I'm going to do one more just for time's sake. 
Unless you want me to do two. Ken. All right. All right. Fallible reliability. Fallible reliability. I'm talking about not the people who say I'm adding to the Bible. I'm talking about uppercase P, lowercase P. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not a writing prophet, but I bring the words of God. So we have this fallible reliability where everyone in Miami is trying to tell you what God's telling you. God's telling me this and God's telling you that. It's, I'm not writing scripture, but I'm telling you what God's telling you. And here, here's, here's the issue with that. I, and, and you may say, are you one of those people that believe that God never talks to people? No, I'm not. I'm not that person. But I am telling you what the focus of God's testifying to you is. It's not that. Let me say, one time I heard God talk to me. That's fine. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But here, here's the issue when that becomes a focus. And everything in Miami is all about what God said to you, to yourself, and what you said, right? Everything's about that. The issue is it, it assumes that we've exhausted God's gospel word already. It assumes that we've exhausted God's infallible gospel word already. We've exhausted it already. God's infallible testimony about his son, we've kind of exhausted that. So we've got to go other places to hear from God. We've exhausted it. It's almost like, you know when you go to Miami Fair, you go there once and you get it, right? You go there once and you get everything. You exhaust it. But when you go to Disneyland, what's it like? You can go to Disneyland the rest of your life and you will never exhaust that place. Beloved, the words in this book about the Christ who loves you, you can visit those words the rest of your life. And you won't even scratch the surface of its richness. We think, hey, man, I've exhausted the word of the gospel. i got to go to all. No, you will. Man, you'll be in heaven for 10 million years, and you won't even get close to the lamb slain's riches. But you exhausted it now. Now we have received, 1 Corinthians 2, two the, the spirit of the world. We haven't received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God. So we may understand what's been freely given to us. The spirit of God is like, I'm going to open the treasures of God's gospel riches. I'm going to speak to you here, speak to you there, address you there. And it's just never going to stop. In these last days, God has spoken to us, Hebrews says, where? In the Son. Let me tell you what I can build my life on as a Christian. Someone comes to me and says, hey, pastor, I got a word to you. Hey, single lady, I got a word to you. You'll be married. Hey, pastor, I got a word to you. Your little church plant's going to blow up. Really? Can I build my life on that? You know what the prophet comes to me and should say? Young man who's struggling, young lady who's struggling, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Tell me something that I could never exhaust like that. Because that's what I can build my life on. Infallible reliability, not fallible possibility. So many Christians are so doubting God because they're hearing all these infallible statements. And I'm like, brother, let me tell you something that is infallible and inexhaustible. Over and over. So here's my last point. Here's my last point. End time perfectionism. End time. Look, I, I could have done like this for like six weeks or something. I don't know. I had to stop somewhere. But you know what the end time perfectionism is? It's the idea that how you are morally when Jesus comes back will bring you to heaven. Which is why in the Pentecostal Advent movement everything is about the perfection of the last day. Everyone's scared to death all the time about the return of Christ. So we got to make sure our moral fortitude is really high so that when we get back we can be behaving really well and morally good enough to enter glory. 
You know what I'm talking about, right? We in Miami. Yo está, I was talking with, I was talking with a Spanish lady. Dios viene a rescatar los limpios. Bueno, no viene para nadie. Se va a dejar todo el mundo. Los limpios. What is the remedy to this idea that how good we are and how great we are on this last point in time is our hope to go to glory? We need an eschatological end time view of justification. An end time view of justification. Let me read Ephesians 2 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah even though we were dead in trespasses. Gets better. You are saved by grace together with Christ Jesus. He also raised us up and seated us in the heavens. Your justification has brought you to the final arrival already. This is why I don't get the whole future justification conversation. I'm there. I've been seated. Because of the perfect righteousness of the last Adam 2,000 years ago was credited to me by faith. I'm there. I have arrived. The final judgment has been cast. The gavel has been dropped. And I am not guilty and righteous. And the last verdict has entered into the presence. What I'm going to hear in that end, I've heard already by virtue of this judgment that Ephesians is talking about. Beloved. We have entered into the final verdict in the present because of Christ. This is how we deal with that particular issue. Listen, maybe, when I come home to my kids after a trip, they shouldn't be wondering if I'm going to kick them out how they, based upon how they are when I get home. I'm going to either kick their behinds and scold them, but they're not, that's not going to happen. Beloved, when Christ comes back for his people, it will be the best day of your life. It's like, oh my gosh, he's coming back. What's going to happen? Glory, bliss. We will be with him forever. Not this scared moment where we're going to all be lined up and wonder how God feels about us. The gavel has been dropped. Already. So concluding points. Beloved, this is an issue of discipleship in our churches, not passing people in other churches. Leave them alone. We shepherd people that you have in your midst and your context and love on them and walk with them over time. It's not your job to shepherd King Jesus. It's not your job to shepherd King Jesus on Facebook. I'm guilty. It's the shepherding issue. And beloved, this is about pastoring people over time. Don't you dare have people coming in and out of all this weird movements and try to fix everything about them the first month you get them in your stinking membership class. You let any one of these brothers be as strangely Pentecostal in your church as long as it takes. I'm 80 years old, been in your church for 20 years. I'm a tongue-speaking lady. Hallelujah. Fine. I'm going to love you. And I'm going to exalt Christ to you. And I'm going to validate you as a woman of God who's loved and precious. No second-class citizens in our churches because they don't get what they don't get. You say, oh, man, people can't take the truth. No, they can't take how we want to exercise our level of spirituality. It took 20 years on that in five minutes. So let's do this over time. A few more things I'd say concluding. Beloved, we need to deconstruct these false views of gospel movements as we construct people. You can't just say, you can't just talk to people coming out of this. Hey, man, we need, the, we need grace, we need the gospel, we need Jesus. Great, everyone says that, but what does it mean to say that? People say, 
Aldo, why are you always saying it's this and it's not that? Because if I'm not saying that, you're not hearing me. You know, you know what it's like? It's like the girl who dates the new guy, but she still acts like she's dating the guy she used to date. And she sees everything through that lens. I got to sit down with her and say, listen, this is not the guy anymore. This is not that. This is this. Beloved, we have to do that. And not just assume that people know what we're talking about as we use concepts. About grace and gospel. I think everybody says the same things in Miami. They just define it moralistically or not. A few things uh, I would say more. Actually, it is a few more things. Um, this is the biggest threat in Miami, I, I, I think. If legalism is the biggest issue and it has multiple forms of expression, this is the biggest issue in Miami. This is the biggest, I think, hindrance to the gospel. This is the biggest stumbling block for the unbeliever. This is the biggest issue in the church. And so I think it needs our attention and prayer and interest. And we can't be people who just want to tiptoe around and just say, well, Miami's Miami. We are who we are. This is something that we need to see as a major issue and a major concern and, and a pastoral address. And the last thing I would say is that, listen, we're not going to disciple people struggling with this stuff by just criticizing those elements of their life. We're going to disciple these people by bringing them to the Christ-centered alternative. You know what I'm talking about? So this, 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 this is what I was at a place in California, and this is how we would have these conversations, or I would see it happen. Hey, you shouldn't do that. That's weird. It's wrong. It's almost like you're in some starving place, got crappy water. Hey, don't drink that water. It sucks. If you don't give them something else to drink from, they will keep drinking that water. So, beloved, bring the Christ, cross, grace, word, sufficiency into all these places and say, look over here. Don't just say, that's unbiblical. You know, it's just like the same thing where we're talking about any issue. Let's exalt the superiority of what Christ offers sinners and not just critique the, the elements. So let me pray and uh, we'll move on. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you would uh, just help us in Miami to love, love and care for all of our gospel forgetfulness and compromise and help us, Lord God, to just walk with each other and apply and move Christ clarity and centrality in more and more people as you would allow, Lord. In your name, amen.